All right, welcome to the third of four town hall meetings on affordable housing and workforce housing and all of the factors that go into housing. If you didn't get an opportunity to view the be, be present um, through GoTo, or if you didn't get an opportunity to view the other two town halls, um, this being the third one, you can always find those out on the city's website. The first one was about bridges and, and um, homelessness and Alice. And the second one was also about homelessness and understanding the spectrum that's involved with, with housing. Tonight, we are going to take a step further along the, the path that we're building here. And we have a number of um, individuals on our panel that we're going to um, have you listen to and understand some more information about the housing difficulties in Sheboygan, Sheboygan County, and also some of the solutions that we're going to be um, starting to talk about. And we, again, hope that you, as you're going along and you think of something that someone says in their presentation, write it down, and we will, we will try to answer those questions as best we can as we go along. So tonight we have Chad from the city, Give us a wave, Chad. There he be. And then we also have uh, with us tonight, Brian from the Economic um, Corporation, uh, Development Corporation, Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Get it right, right? <laughs> All right. And then we also have Kristen, who, give us a wave, Kristen, is also virtual. And she's going to talk about the business perspective that goes along with housing and the difficulties that go along with so many th factors that are here. So listen close, um, write down your ideas and your thoughts and your questions, and we will get to those as we go along on there. So we're going to turn it over to Chad, who's going to talk to us about this, the city. Thank you, Joe. So again, this I'm Chad Pelshek, and I'm the City Planning and Development Director for the City of Sheboygan, and I'm actually in the Wisconsin Dells area at a conference, so that's why I'm on remote versus City Hall. So, Scott, if you can go to the next slide. So what we wanted to do today is cover a couple topics. We are going to um, be looking at the results of the city's affordable housing study that was uh, completed in March of 2021. And some of this might be a uh, repeat for some of the viewers, but um, anyway, we're going to kind of give you a quick synopsis of it. The full report is available on the city's website. If you like data and you like numbers, there's lots of numbers there and you can dig in a lot deeper. And then we're going to uh, talk about some of the recent uh, efforts that the city is making to address affordable housing in the city of Sheboygan. So the slide that you see up now, the recap of findings of the recent study is an age cohort projections for the county. So um, we like to start out with where are we going with our population? And from this uh, slide, you can see that um, the population sector in the green um, is the 65 to 84 year olds. So the, the next um, you know, tw 20 years or so shows that our population is going to grow older, um, which we knew about. Uh, we know that we need to recruit younger folks and younger families. So we're hoping that, um, you know, we can go against the grain and, and try to get uh, other age groups in the younger spectrum to come in. But, um, you know, one of the study as city planners we need to look at is how are we uh, accommodating the uh, rise in in older demographics from the from the county as a whole and the city as that matters. So if you can go to the next slide. So this slide shows the building permits from 2015 to 2020. Um, and what I would say is the city has not built a lot of residential housing over the course of the last 20 plus years. Um, you'll see a little bit of spike in numbers and 
in 2016 and 17, and that's really related to the recent um, housing developments that have been built. Um, and then you look at the, slide, the graph on the right, the multi-apartment and multi-condo, um, you'll see some jumps in those numbers. A lot of this has to do with how some of these recent developments have been um, like, have been built under the building code um, to get around certain requirements. So it's how we categorize them. But you can see that um, you know there is there is numbers uh, increases in in housing numbers, but they're not where they need to be to keep up with demand. Can you go to the next slide? So this slide shows really the county as a whole. So this is the total housing units by the for the Sheboygan County. And what you can see from this slide is in the 1990s through 2005 or so, a little bit before that, there was an aggressive increase in single family and multifamily. After we came out of the recession in 2007 down to 2010, that dropped off to almost nothing. We've rebounded a little bit in 2015, but nowhere near where we need to be to keep up with demand. So we've between our, the city of Sheboygan and the county as a whole, we have a lot of work to do to keep up with housing. So next slide. So this shows rental unit vacancy. And one of the things I would say by this slide is uh, in one of the earlier presentations, if you happen to watch, Emily talked about how the vacant, what the vacancy rate is, she gave a definition and she said that the vacancy rate for the city of Sheboygan is 3.3%. And you can see that from the slide. Um, you can see that the other um, city of Sheboygan Falls and, and Village of Kohler have no vacancy rates. Um, so the there's a lot of demand for housing out there. On the bottom, the notes say a typical healthy vacancy rate is between five and 7% and a vacancy rate around five to 7% provides an appropriate balance between supply and demand with enough units for people to have choices. So with a vacancy rate as 12, 31, 20, 20 um, and I realize it's a little dated, but um, it hasn't changed much over 2021 or it maybe even has gone down a little bit. Um, there isn't a lot of opportunity for housing choice, housing in, in the market. Next slide. Uh, Emily also hit on fair market rents for the city of Sheboygan, fair market rents, what that definition is. And this is a graph to kind of back up what she had talked about. So fair market rent is used to determine the payment standard amounts for a housing choice voucher and Section 8 federally funded housing programs. So the, the chart on the right that you see shows, uh, based on a two-bedroom unit, what the, um, mar what the market, the fair market rate uh, rent rates are it currently in 2021, it's about $769. Um, so, you know, this is what HUD uses as a, as a fair rent for a two bedroom unit. Um, granted it's less if it's a, you know, a one bedroom unit, but at any rate, uh, you know, we hear all the time, the need for more units in that three to $500 range. And you know those there was fair market rent for three to five hundred dollars back in the 1990s, uh, early 2000s, some 21 plus years ago. So inflation, rent rate, and increases, and um, you know keeps driving up those costs. And these are looked at yearly, but you can kind of see where the average rent should be in the city of Sheboygan. And I understand that not everybody can afford. Um, even the uh, fair market rents. Next slide. So this is kind of the synopsis of a of about a uh, six hundred page document that talks about what the demand projections are for the city of Sheboygan going forward. So what you see on the left is uh, the rental units, uh, four hundred and one to one hundred and twenty three by twenty twenty three, or forty to one hundred and two per year. You can see in the arrow it talks about what the um, what the average rents rates need to be for those uh, rental units. These are considered in the study as affordable rental units. This was a affordable housing study, so you can see where that where that sits. And I understand that there's you know there's people that are looking for a lot less than this. And we'll talk about the issue with that as we move forward. On the bottom, the owner-occupied units, we need around 715 by 
715 new ones by 2030 to keep up with the current demands. And this is based on these predictions are based on a number of factors, including the unemployment rate and the uh, information shared by a lot of our uh, large employers for what they need to recruit, as well as what the um, senior housing kind of demands are. So when you look at the senior independent living piece, you can see that uh, we need about a thousand units subsidized uh, at that point, and then under the senior assisted living, around 200 units of assisted living, and that would be where you would be able to get services. Next slide. So on this slide is, there's a lot of information on this slide, but um, basically the chart on the left talks about all of the housing units that have been developed in the city of Sheboygan to the tune of about 162 million. 949 units have been uh, built total. You can see of these 949, 401 of them have been considered affordable. Uh, 495 are market rate and 36 are condominium units. If you look at the chart on the right, this compares when they were built by the year compared to the gross domestic product. Um, and, and, and it compares the city of Sheboygan with the city of Fond du Lac, which is a very similar population size. So, you know, we, the city of Sheboygan's gross GDP as an economic indicator is substantially higher than uh, the city of Fond du Lac. And, you know, you can kind of see from there the, the letters correlate back to the chart as to when the different developments were built. Next slide. So the study also recommended a number of things related to funding to try to fund affordable housing at a more efficient rate. So um, what you're seeing here is a, diff a whole plethora of things to do to try to increase number one, home ownership, additional rental units, and to fund those rental units and home ownership. So this is different programs and all of these are being leveraged at this point to uh, try to build this affordable housing need in the community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of it when we move forward. Next slide. So the study recommendations had a number of capacity building initiatives, regulation and partnerships. Some of this stuff is what you're seeing uh, today um, with this town hall meeting. So the establishing a housing committee and kind of working with our partners um, to develop how you know to talk about housing and the need and and brainstorm and work on grants and all of that kind of stuff is all happening behind the scenes between the city and the housing coalition partners as well as other uh, housing partners in the uh, community purchase and market city owned redevelopment properties is a key piece and i'll talk about that as as we move forward but we really the city really needs to be aggressive and finding those opportunities to try to foster these affordable housing um, developments because the cost does not allow somebody to pay a higher price for land. So next slide. So when you look at addressing the funding challenges, this is from the study, the break even point to construct one unit of affordable housing in the city of Sheboygan is $1,300 per month for a one bedroom. And so when we hear that people want rents in the five, six, seven, three, four, five, six, seven per month, that generates a significant gap in the performer per month that needs to come up, needs to be filled with other funding sources. So if you're, you know, if it's costing 1300 a month to build it and it's, you're charging $500 a month, that $900 difference, 800, 900 difference has to come from someplace to get these to work because developers aren't going to develop these unless they can make money because that's their business. So there's a few ways of doing that. Um, Section 42 tax credit program, one of those ways, the city providing TIF dollars, um, enhancement of the city's now called affordable housing fund, which was previously called neighborhood revitalization fund. And that's a, a new fund that's be established to start providing funding mechanisms and and opportunities to purchase land and do different affordable housing type initiatives and then provide vacant city owned land by selling property at dollar um, to be put towards an incentive on the project and we hear that a lot that um, why is the city giving away this land for a dollar well it's either we give it away for a dollar or we give them tiff incentives because they can't make the number work so you know i think in a nutshell the 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 thing here is it's a challenge to 
construction costs are spiraling out of space and getting getting um, you know materials on time and supply chain issues is only adding to the problem and it's not getting any easier. And Section 42 WIDA tax credit programs are very competitive and everybody across the state is looking for affordable housing. Next slide. So the next thing, why is this important to the city and the county? So we understand that we have lower income resident needs in the community that need housing. So that would be a num that would be one of the reasons. Another reason, and and uh, the other people on the call, I'm sure, will talk about this. But Sheboygan County has over 3,500 open positions at any given stage, and the companies are telling us that if they can't recruit employees to this county, their next investments are not going to be in this county. So if a company is going to do an expansion, but they can't find the workforce, they're going to go to where the workforce is, and that probably isn't going to be in Sheboygan County. And then when families and individuals re relocate here for positions, they have a hard time finding housing. So that's um, another kind of factor playing into this. And in order to retain these companies, we need to find, they need to find workers and, and workers need to find housing. So it's kind of a spiral thing that kind of steps down and, and all of it is affected. Next slide. So I'm going to switch gears here and talk about some projects that the city is currently working on to try to address some of these affordable housing concerns. So if you can go to the next slide. First one is the Commonwealth Development Project at 14th in Indiana. This would be 14, uh, 48 units. It is a bus route to provide transportation that was one of the questions if we look at that in making decisions and the answer is yes um, the property is currently vacant they would build um, one in up to three bedroom units that would be 350 for one bedroom up to a thousand for three bedrooms it's a 12 million dollar project we're waiting on a number of opportunities to fund this everything from we to tax credits to the city's American Rescue Plan Act dollars to the to State Rescue Plan Act, uh, Act dollars. So hopefully this project will move forward in 20, uh, late 2021 when it gets hopefully awarded some funding mechanisms that it can move forward because it needs these alternate funding sources to cash flow and for the developer to invest this 12 million into it and be able to keep the rents lower. Next slide. The next project is uh, what I would call the Partners for Community Development Project. There's really not a name, but it's on the corner of North 13th and Erie Avenue. Um, it's vacant land. This is east of the Burger King. It would be 44 affordable housing units and some dedicated for veterans. It is on a bus route. Rents would be between 350 and, and 1100 and very much like the other project, they're waiting for award of tax credits and ARPA dollars from both the state and the city to try to fund it and get it off the ground. So um, they just did a rezone for the property. So we're optimistic that hopefully this one can move forward as well. Next slide. And then the last project is Berkshire Sheboygan. This is on the former capsule property. This would be the property that would be west of the Pacifico restaurant on Indiana Avenue. Um, this is a general capital project through general capital partners. It would be a mix of senior housing and live work. If you can go to the next slide. So the, um, these are the live work units. So there would be dedicated senior and then there would be dedicated affordable live work open to anybody where you live work is where you can have a little commercial space. So if you were an artist, you could have a gallery in your living unit in the front on the um, street side and be able to kind of be living there, but also running your business out of your house. Next slide. So this is uh, up to 100 units of senior housing and 18 units of live work. It's a $26 million project. Um, this is looking to be funded with WIDA low income tax credit and city TIF. Um, would be 55 one bedroom senior units at seven at six hundred and sixty five dollars twenty eight two bedroom at nine sixty three and eighteen of the live work at fifteen hundred and fifteen units for thousand eighty six those would not be seen um, and this is on a bus route located near the downtown in the lakefront and is kind of the first senior housing affordable senior housing project that has been 
brought to the market in a number of years. So we're excited to hopefully see this thing move forward as well. Like, and then, so we're thinking ahead and trying to locate other sites to meet future housing needs in the community. So next week, the city will close on purchasing the Jacob Hall property up on North 15th Street with the idea of demolishing uh, this property to make way for a new affordable housing. What kind of affordable housing? I'm not quite sure. Uh, whether single family or some type of multifamily, but we're using American Rescue Plan funds to fund this. And we looked at this as an opportunity to get about an acre and a half of property in the central city on a bus road close to amenities. And so we're starting to look for these opportunities around the community to try to kind of build our uh, portfolio and properties so we have alternate locations to help facilitate some affordable housing. Additional ones from the ones I just talked about. Next slide. And the last thing that we're working on is the purchase of 196 plus acres of land on the city's south side. So the council on Monday night should approve a contract to purchase um, this from Dave Gar Farms. Um, this is off of Menning Road, just south of Weeding Creek. I'll show you shortly on a map where it is, but it um, would be 196 acres. It would be 88 acres that the city already owns, known as the Pole Farm. Um, the goal here is to build three to five, maybe as much as 600 single family housing units with a combination of affordable single family, um, some middle range single family and some senior um, single family. So. It's yet to be determined, but we don't have a lot of land. We're pretty much landlocked. This is an opportunity for the city for the next 10 to 15 years to try to grow our inventory of single family housing um, and, and some focused on some areas focused on affordable single family. Um, this property is not on a bus route, although we've been talking to the Shoreline Metro and they're aware that it's going to have to be, the bus routes are going to have to be modified down there because it also needs to service the new South Point Enterprise campus, which is in the same, so if you can go to the next slide. These, this just shows the map of where this is located. So the, the one on the left kind of shows the blue area. This is adjacent to the uh, Riverdale Golf Course. Uh, Road and Stall Road is kind of the intersection of where this property lies. The proper, the map on the right shows a zoom in of 196 acres the city would be buying. And the green area shows the property that the city already owned and purchased 30 some years ago for future subdivisions. So um, those two would be combined and that's, this will be master planned and we'll work with a number of uh, different developers to bring different products to the market. So, in a nutshell, that's what we have going on. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or however Joe wants to handle it from here, but we are aggressively trying to address the affordable housing. We've heard from a lot of people why all of the housing that nobody can afford, although most of them are full, um, but know that there's a demand for lower priced housing. It's just trying to get the numbers to work so that the city doesn't have to invest a lot of money to uh, see those types of developments. Well, that's it from me, thank you. Well, thank you, Chad, that uh, that was very comprehensive and that, that you guys have been very, 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 very busy apparently. Uh, <laughs> so keep up the good work. Um, let's, let's first of all, allow anyone who wants to ask a question to unmike themselves and um, for Chad, anything that he has covered that you would like clarification or any, um, any question that he might, you might have for Chad. Feel free to unmike yourself if you want to question. Well, I will, I will say then, uh, there's a couple comments in, in the chat that I, I'd like to read just so that uh, people know that we're, we are reading them and that everybody knows. It says, current condos available, this is from Sue, current condos available are way out of reasonable price range. As a senior, I could not sell my home and downsize, which I desperately want to do, but 
can't afford to go into anything but low income apartments. So I, any comments, Chad, to what Sue had to say? I would say, sorry, got two of them going again. So I would say that uh, we're aware of that. Um, again, it's very difficult to build affordable housing and affordable condos that um, people are willing to pay at a lesser price because of the construction costs. But um, we're hopeful that with some of this new land that we're purchasing on the south side, that hopefully that we can try we can try to address those concerns. But it really comes down to the price of construction and how much incentive the city has to put into the deal to make the numbers work. And it does really come down to the numbers um, game that's there. And so that you're, you're looking at different avenues to be able to fund some of those projects that were there. Uh, Emily has a question that's out in the... <laughs> um, you, yeah, you do have a couple of audience members today. And one of the questions that they are asking is, are there any plans or what, if, if the city knows of, that they're going to do with the old hospital memorial when it's when it switches over to the hospital. Um, is there is there anything that the city's looking to, to get involved in with that, or does anyone have any idea what plans look like? Chad, Chad, could you uh, could you hear her, or you want me? I, they're wondering about the old hospital and what might become of that once they switch over. So yes, yeah, so the city has a redevelopment agreement in place with Advocate Aurora. And uh, they have to start demolition on the hospital within three um, years of the occupancy date of the new hospital, which happens to be April 11th of 2022 is when they're moving into the doctors are moving in. Some of the doctors are moving into the new hospital. So uh, under that agreement, they need to work with the city and a developer to one, either redevelop the property or either work to redevelop for them to work with the developer to redevelop now what it would be i'm not sure it needs to be consistent with the current zoning which is neighborhood residential six so it would be a similar kind of layout as you see with the properties that are there but the prop the entire hospital will be demolished and it'll be redeveloped into some type of housing but that's yet to be determined thank you thank you for that answer chad um Tracy asked the question in, in the chat, where, where would the Berkshire be located? It's on the vacant property of where the, um, basically west of the Pacifico restaurant. So right on the Sheboygan River up to like 10th Street where like the Craft 30 bar used to be and some vacant residential units um, and then there was some properties along Indiana, basically west of like the end zone bar. So it would be that vacant parcel of land that has river frontage. Thank you, thank you. And then uh, Martha asked, um, this information, this is a comment, so this is good. This information is very helpful and interesting. It's exciting to hear about the efforts for affordable housing and the senior and live work project sounds very cool. I would love to share this information with others. Is it in summary form like this somewhere for people to check it out? It isn't um, necessarily, but this PowerPoint will be available when this recording is brought up on the city's website as part of this town hall series. So you can refer to that at any stage. And, and the recording itself will be there. So uh, you can always refer back to that also. Yes. Um, Abby, any, any further questions for Chad? Well, actually, I feel like you covered a lot of them, Chad, so um, that were already, I think, suitable for this town hall. But I did have a question myself. Um, so I know you were talking about the difference. There was a slide that you had that talked about, like, the difference in single um, family units and duplexes and then how multi-unit properties went up in, like, how many we created or built in a certain period of time. And you said it was partly due, be, due to the like building codes, I think. So I just kind of wanted to inquire a little bit more about that and what you meant by that. Like 
How did that change? Sure. So some of them. Um, can I just jump in? There's a question here that kind of goes right along with that. So I'm going to throw that in right with it. All right. The, the, yeah, go ahead. It says, what, it says what regulatory barriers could be removed at the local level to enable construction of affordable housing. So that kind of goes along with that. So thanks. So um, I think the, uh, sorry, I just turned off my camera, maybe on your side, I don't know, but anyway. Um, so the, the, there's, we, our zoning ordinances are pretty well suited for maximizing space and, and trying to deal with this uh, issue. So uh, we have a very small lot size requirement now um, for the minimum lot size, our setbacks and all of that stuff are uh, always amended for allowing new development and new single families to be built. So when to answer that question, I don't know that there's a, a lot of changes that could happen on our side, unlike maybe some people that are more out in suburb areas where they have uh, different uh, layouts and different lot sizes. So the city has really tried to maximize the limited amount of developable space we have and in encouraging density and encouraging as much uh, development as we can ha we can get uh, with what we have. To answer the question about the building codes that Abby had, that was really related to, uh, so some of them, like the ones that were, were built by Van Horn, those river townhomes off of, on the former Kingsbury property, those were uh, built as a two-family unit, so they didn't they didn't have to put sprinklers in them. Likewise, the ones down on South Pier were done that way as well, so they could get around some uh, building codes and keep their costs less and then be able to charge less. So, uh, and, that, and then it really just affect how the city reports those under uh, the building code and what and whether they're a multi-unit or a two-family unit. So that was the answer to that question. I'd, I'd like to remind everybody that um, during the fourth town hall, we're going to have a panel discussion going on and some um, further questions that if we don't get to this evening will, will crop up and will be discussed at that period of time. So please uh, put it on your schedule for two weeks from today, that, that open forum that we're going to have for discussing that. I think we'll take one more question out of there. Out of there in that the, the quick question in the chat. There's another question in the chat, Joe, and it's from Sue Kaiser wondering if we've considered using empty buildings for um, for projects and for affordable. Actually, we have renovating an existing building into an affordable housing is even more expensive than building from ground up because the codes are so much more restrictive and the cost to do so is is diff, is so much more. So it's actually cheaper for developers to build from ground up and build it the right way the first time that they want it than to try to go in and modify spaces under the current ordinance and make them work. For example, the Badger State loss was 118 units of affordable housing. They spent $30 million renovating that to get 118 units. Likewise, this Berkshire Sheboygan would be right around the same number and they're spending around 25 to 26 million. So you can see that uh, renovating existing buildings is a lot more costly than it is to build from the ground up. Sue is also asking out of, the, out of there about tiny homes. Um, uh, if, if anyone has looked into um, the possibility of tiny homes for low income housing. I don't know that anybody has, and I think what you're seeing is that no one has been able to build a tiny home that uh, is able to be built, is able to be lived in in the winter when it's 35 below zero. Um, all tiny home shows you see online, they're all in warmer climates that don't have winter conditions like we have. So until somebody can design a tiny home that has the R value that's required uh, to live in that thing year round. Um, I don't think you're going to see them built, but maybe in the future, somebody comes up with a design that works, but right now it does not exist. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions, but I think we will move on. Uh, and uh, if we get time at the end, we will 
be asking those questions once again. So uh, we're going to move on to uh, ARPA dollars and uh, the recommendations for that, and Brian's going to speak to us about that. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Chad. Uh, good evening. I'm Brian Doudna. I'm with the uh, Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, and we'll get our slides up in a moment. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I'll talk a little bit about the Economic Development Corporation and what we're, uh, what we're up to uh, uh, at a countywide level, and then get into the ARPA recommendations. Next slide. So just from, I moved to Sheboygan County in October of uh, 2020. Uh, we did a strategic planning process in November of 2020, and we adopted the new strategic direction in uh, December of 2020. And you'll notice number four is single family home development. Um, very definitely there had been a lot of initiatives around apartments, but we're saying uh, it actually is affordable single family homes that are really the niche where we're going to be trying to, um, because we've built the awareness of Sheboygan as a place to build apartments. Now we have to build the awareness for single family homes. Uh, but you can also see some of the challenges that we have in the marketplace uh, with uh, net population growth, net in migration. We're in the uh, out of 380 metros in the country. We're ranked 364 or 329. So, but we're the number one in large organizations for the size of our population base and employment base. Not number one, I mean, number one MSA in the country. So when you think about the unique uh, business models that we have in this marketplace, uh, it is truly a unique model and a unique situation and economy that we have here. So uh, when we look at um, preservation of our economy and also I always look at preservation of wealth, uh, I think this is mission critical for uh, the uh, county and all municipalities throughout the county. Next slide. Our challenge is lack of affordable housing. So back in June of 2021, this is a, a little more current than what you saw in the housing uh, study, but a balanced housing market for single family homes, you typically have around 120 days of a uh, housing supply. As of June of last year, we had 10 days of housing supply in Sheboygan County for homes under 250,000. In the entire county for all price ranges, we were at 20 days. So the natural market uh, forces of single family homes is really just not uh, functioning appropriately at this time in the county, uh, regardless of municipality. Uh, next slide. You saw this slide in uh, Chad's presentation we just added to it. Um, w because of the Great Recession, you had a lot of uh, single family um, home contractors that went out of business or were unable to build single family homes at an affordable rate just because they couldn't get financing. Because of the shrinking of the financial markets, uh, they were not able to go out and build and get uh, homes built uh, at the traditional levels. Um, and then you can see what the SEDC in 2015 with in partnership with the municipalities really went out and started uh, working with developers to bring in these WIDA type uh, tax credit deals. So you can see the uptick, but our single family homes, just because we lost a lot of builders over that time frame, just has not rebounded at the same pace. Uh, and, um, and we'll get into the market uh, forces of that next. So next slide. Um, in trying to understand all the dynamics uh, of what's happening, uh, we are working with UW-Madison Real Estate and Urban Studies, uh, and two classes will be coming into Sheboygan County to assess up to 20, uh, I said 15, but I just submitted 23 parcels today uh, that they will be looking at uh, for what is the highest and best use, what's the mix of housing that can be brought to bear to support the type of homes and the pricing of homes that we need in the marketplace. So that's not all single family homes, but that could be a mixture of senior, uh, tied back to the housing study, senior, independent living, as well as rentals. Um, so the good news from my perspective is, is that the UW uh, classes, that res residential property development 
That is their capstone project. So they go from identifying the site, coming up with renderings of what that site might look like, and then actually saying, how can you finance it, and how can you make it work? So what we're trying to do is, of those 23 parcels, we're gonna have a game plan on how municipalities can help make those projects come to fruition. So uh, applaud what the city is doing with uh, the projects that I just talked about, but what we're trying to do is help build the additional pipeline throughout the county and not just the city of Sheboygan, but throughout the county. But I think uh, for the city of Sheboygan of the 23 parcels, six of them were in uh, the city of Sheboygan. Uh, next slide. So from a countywide perspective, uh, forming a housing strategy, land of identification, uh, target lands, and that's what the city has been doing with uh, what they, uh, Chad just mentioned, but we are trying to do that throughout the county. Uh, recruit developers and builders within parameters to meet local goals. Again, uh, making sure that they know the type of housing we want, the price points that we need to hit, so that, uh, again, we get a, ho a housing mix that actually meets the local needs uh, of the various populations uh, that are out there. Uh, we are also working on uh, financial tools uh, with the uh, financial institutions, uh, and uh, I won't go into detail on that, but in a couple of months, you'll hear more about the financial institution tools that are gonna be developed. Um, and then as far as when we're looking at these uh, affordable homes and affordable lots, um, the way I view it is 50 and 60 foot lots are what can be built with uh, the cost of construction, 50 foot frontage for uh, a housing lot, and 60 foot are really what's gonna be affordable uh, type of homes because of the cost of sewer water and all the infrastructure that goes through that. If you look at history and what has been done, and I would agree with Chad on the city of uh, Sheboygan, a lot of the um, neighborhoods are on 50 to 60 foot lots. Kohler also is uh, in the, where they were uh, doing the, the build out between 52 and 60 foot lots in Kohler as well. So what we're really doing is going back to that infill mass uh, build out uh, models for affordability. And then the market rates uh, lots, which is where you're seeing most of the homes being built today are 70 to 90 foot uh, frontage lots. And that cost of infrastructure going across that uh, home a lot is really where the costs continue to go up. So you're looking at uh, individual lot going for 50 to 60,000 where the affordable lots need to be in the 30 uh, to 40,000 and hopefully lower than that, but uh, that's where development agreements with municipalities, TIF, ARPA, uh, tax credits from WIDA all need to be part, uh, part of the strategy uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide. And we don't call them tiny homes, but we call them smaller homes. Uh, and so what we're looking at uh, from trying to make sure that uh, uh, zoning codes, uh, we can look at uh, the lot sizes and things of that nature, but also making sure that we look at home sizes that are more affordable as well, so that as people want to downsize uh, from larger homes into smaller homes, this, well, hopefully they can have a newer home, but still uh, um, be independent and be in a price point that is affordable. Uh, again, Cost of materials right now uh, is uh, uh, a deterrent uh, for uh, affordability, um, but uh, that's where uh, we'll need to come up with innovative solutions to make uh, all that work in a very short period of time. Next slide. So now on to the ARPA task force. Um, so we had uh, 21 members from throughout the uh, county representing different organizations from the trades to the banking industry to Habitat for Humanity, Partners for Community Development. Uh, Joe, uh, from your uh, organization, your group uh, participated, and then also uh, with the municipalities uh, as well. 
the one thing I would just say that um, we had, and I'm showing in the next slide the number of meetings, but 21 participants, I think the lowest attendance we had was 17 at a meeting. So um, go on to the next slide. And we had seven meetings. And we covered a lot of what you talked about with ARPA, uh, and I should say ALICE report. We covered the Sheboygan housing study. Uh, we actually brought in the Wisconsin Realtors uh, report on falling behind and what's going on and what our recommendations around zoning. So we actually went through zoning and talked about what uh, municipalities have to do to be um, uh, more proactive in affordability uh, and uh, providing options. Uh, we also went through the financial programs of what a developer needs, what a homeowner need, might need, as well as renters and the homeless, uh, and have had summaries from um, uh, local service providers like CAP uh, uh, here, uh, to the city, to the county, to um, Partners for Community Development, as well as Habitat. So we really assessed and under, tried to understand the local tools already in existence, what populations were being covered, uh, what were the gaps in that funding model, in that funding matrix, uh, so that we can try to come up with solutions using the county and or city ARPA dollars. Um, workforce housing recommendations, so we had a preliminary summary of what those might be. Uh, we actually uh, did, um, uh, voting process to that uh, and survey uh, tool to that. Then we had a separate meeting after we did some of that, then we did underserved populations and really focused in on what are the types of needs uh, and the locations that might be appropriate. And so at the end of the day, uh, we came up with recommendations that uh, there will be four submitted to the county board and to the city of Sheboygan. And we'll go on to the next slide. Those four are tied to uh, workforce, affordable entry level housing, and trying to provide as much flexibility to that uh, funding as possible. So uh, Chad talked about the different grant programs. Um, so trying to have some of those grant programs actually be tied to local dollars rather than state dollars would be uh, part of the goal here. A home repair loan uh, program with the eligibility of up to 120% uh, of an area medium income. Currently, the programs are 80% of uh, area median income and below. Uh, and those programs are not um, uh, being, I guess, uh, utilized uh, fully. So what we want to do is increase that so we improve the housing stack across the county. And so that uh, those that uh, may be uh, um, stretched on their home payments but uh, still can afford a little bit, uh, they can make some improvements to their uh, homes. The uh, next category is down payment assistance, also for that same uh, population, so that um, just because you're making it, you still, you, there is that cliff of benefits, and we're trying to help that population as well. Uh, many of those are also part of the Alice population. As, uh, uh, mm -hmm. And then the housing navigator, uh, would be the last recommendation and trying to make sure that um, as these tools are launched and implemented that there is a way for people to ac access them and actually be uh, walked through the system and uh, I always call it, uh, hold their hand and make sure that they're uh, coming up with uh, solutions that's best for them and for their opportunities as they are moving forward uh, in determining where their family might live. Okay, so recommendation number one, uh, there will be a recommendation for $3 million uh, tied to this workforce affordable entry level housing. And that is gonna be tied to potentially investing directly into uh, apartments. It could be mezzanine financing uh, on apartments. It could be finding land uh, and acquiring land so that um, other tools can be brought uh, to bear to make things happen. Uh, the goal is to build as many homes, affordable homes, uh, as possible. Uh, and I would, I would stress that um, this would also be um, more focused in on single family homes, 
Not, nothing against apartments, but I would just say uh, we would be looking at single family homes as much as possible because that is not part of the mix that uh, is traditionally out there. So one time dollars, let's try to uh, deal with one time uh, opportunity with single family homes. The second would be $200,000 to Habitat for Humanity. I know they just received a $240,000 grant, I believe. But uh, prior to that, um, in talking with their um, board and uh, staff, they have enough volunteer capacity for building, they build three homes a year. They had enough volunteer capacity for four, but they didn't have the financial wherewithal to do four. So this is maximizing their volunteer commitment and uh, maximizing uh, where we can go. Eligibility in the final rule you can uh, see, I just took take excerpts from the rule of ARPA and uh, very definitely there's income levels tied to this and I would just say that uh, the county will be able to have more flexible dollars, not necessarily the city, but the county will have more flexible dollars uh, to make some of these recommendations uh, come to market, if they so choose. Uh, if, uh, so next slide. The second recommendation is uh, would be working with partners for community development and providing a $1.5 million uh, revolving loan fund uh, tied to housing. Uh, and that would be hopefully 35 projects initially uh, based on past utilization of similar programs uh, that there would be 35 uh, housing projects that could be incorporated. And then uh, again, trying to improve stable and affordable housing uh, to make sure that uh, we have um, sustainable uh, home ownership. Also home weatherization uh, based on during the meetings with the task force, um, some of the housing stock uh, reports were uh, kind of um, horrific uh, from my perspective. And so really trying to make sure that uh, we're reinvesting in the existing housing stock as much as possible. Recommendation three is down to, uh, tied to down payment assistance. Uh, there are down payment assistance programs at the local level, but also at the state level and also through financial institutions. So if you're under 80% of an area me medium income, you have access to down payment assistance through WIDA with Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority. Uh, you can actually finance up to 100% of the uh, house through WIDA. Uh, so, but they also, uh, through local financial institutions, you should be asking if they are part of a Advantage Plus program, which provides $6,000 of down payment assistance uh, for uh, people under 80% of area uh, median income. And then you have the local programs as well. Uh, what we also would be, so in this case, we would be looking at this $600,000 being tied to 80 to 120% of area median income, again, trying to get that working family into houses rather than apartments um, and bring that affordability into uh, play. And you can see the eligibility. And then the last component is the housing navigator. And that would be, uh, again, uh, a three-year uh, pilot on getting, uh, working with partners for community development. They kind of serve in that role today based on the, the um, meetings that we had with the task force. And we would be trying to support uh, that type of initiative. And that may be in partnership with uh, municipality uh, funding as well. Well, thank you, Brian. That is comprehensive and uh, it gives us a better understanding of ARPA and uh, some of the projects that are going on countywide. Um, uh, we once again ask if uh, you have a question specific to uh, what Brian has presented. Um, you can unmute your microphone right now and, and feel free to go ahead and ask your question. Emily, you have, go, to, go to the podium, please. Oh, okay. Ouch. Careful, though. Okay. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, like, it, what we're talking about right now is a lot of recommendations, um, which I, I think they're all fantastic. Yeah. What is the likelihood that that funding will go through and those recommendations can become a reality? 
Very good question. I wish I had, uh, could read the tea leaves of that. Um, we uh, present to the County Executive Committee on March 3rd. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, there are many requests uh, for going to ARPA uh, to get ARPA dollars. Um, so, all we can say is uh, give our best case of why uh, these uh, should be priority dollars. Is there a possibility that some of the recommendations will go through and not all of them? Correct. Okay, because there's other initiatives for that money as well right now, correct? Correct. So, uh, and I'll just say my understanding is of the county dollars, and we're not talking about the city, but uh, mm -hmm. about the county dollars, uh, there's $22 million that was allocated to the county. Around six or seven million of that has been uh, allocated already. Okay. So there's around 16 million, is my understanding, available for these task force and or for the county board to say what where are their priorities from a county perspective as well as from the ARPA recommendations. Uh, there are six task force. Uh, so you have uh, child should, care. So you got child care, broadband, transit, uh, housing, uh, workforce development, and did I say mental health? mental health? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So. So, and everybody is vying for the same amount of money? There, there, let's just say every um, recommendation, there are allocation requests, and um, that would be a county board decision on. So, it, it varies in percentages of that, of that money based on recommendation, each recommendation is a different piece. Yeah. Some okay. of those task forces were working together in, Absolutely. in conjunction so that they know of each other and that the, some of the is overlapping. Well, yeah, obviously, I mean, all these, we, we've done Bridges and we've done Allison here. Exactly. We've talked about the way the, all of these pieces intersect and overlap. So that's already been discussed in here. So I, I, I love the fact that everyone's working together. So thank you. I just, I, yeah. Yeah, I know the recommendations are fantastic. It's just a matter of how much of a reality they are. And it really, we'll find out March 3rd, huh? Six? Well, that's the, the first step. Oh. Okay. And then it goes to the full county board, which I believe would be in April okay. or uh, May timeframe. So there actually may be an election before the county actually takes action. Wow. Okay. So there's pieces. We have good ideas, and we're hoping that they're going to go through. This is but at this point, everything this is, is a, this is beginning of the process. Excellent. Thank you very much. I really appreciate yep. it. I really love that um, that getting involved UW and the ability to for them to come in and to do some of the the uh, the legwork and and just hearing that they. They go all the way through the whole plan. It's just incredible. Well, and, and from my perspective, uh, I just see there's a lot of um, um, individuals or families that are trying to determine what they want to do with prop properties and what's the next generation. And this gives them an opportunity to get some free technical assistance. And hopefully we can do this not just this time, but probably two or three years from now, we can do that again. Um, because. The need for land and the need for housing is not going to go away, and so this is a, a long-term need within the county. Mm -hmm. There is one question in here. Um, I, I see that Chad answered Brandon's question about sidewalks. I hope that uh, meets the needs of, of that on the sidewalk. But Tracy asked, um, Brian presented a stat whereby Sheboygan was number one large institution slash 1,000 workers. I miss the definition of institutions. So we uh, were the number one MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area, for large employers for the size of our workforce. So we have more large employers as a percentage of our total employment. That's the way you should be looking at that. So when you look at... Um, I mean, our top 10 employers are making up a pretty large chunk of our workforce. And interesting that we brought that up because with the next person up, um, if we have no other further questions uh, for Brian right now, um, is Kristen, and she's going to tell us about workforce issues and challenges in the housing area. Kristen? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me here today. <clears throat> um, I'm Kristen Young. I'm Talent Acquisition Manager for Johnsonville. 
Uh, my message today is going to be brief. Um, I'm here to provide the employer perspective on this topic. And I thought I would just share this beautiful um, dinner option. So if you haven't had a chance to eat yet, um, on the way home, feel free to go, go pick up some Johnsonville sausage and maybe you can um, make this recipe here. Um, <clears throat> I think we've heard some really great information today. And um, I'm just, like I said, I'd, I'd love to share kind of what we're seeing at Johnsonville. So just a little bit of background, Johnsonville is a privately owned company, like many of our other um, large manufacturers in the area. <clears throat> we're headquartered in Sheboygan Falls. Uh, our product is available in all 50 states, over 45 countries. We have approximately 3,000 employees, which we refer to as members. About half of those members live and work here in Sheboygan County. About 700 members live in just the city of Sheboygan. So about 1,500 in Sheboygan County and about half of those 700 in the city of Sheboygan. So our main campus includes our uh, global headquarters, our technical center, and we have three large manufacturing facilities. And we also now have um, acquired an additional manufacturing facility in Shibu the city of Sheboygan, which we call Lakeside, which we are uh, beginning to staff this year. So talking just Sheboygan County, <clears throat> we can expect about 50 to 60 external hires just into salary roles for Johnsonville um, on average per year. And then we also hire approximately 40 external operations members a month. Um, and that's directly from the Sheboygan County market. Recruiting outside of Sheboygan County is a must for us and for other companies in order to fill our open positions. So what I'm sharing here, <clears throat> well, actually, before I get to this, um, we know that Sheboygan is a popular manufacturing county, and we actually have 317% more manufacturing jobs per capita than the national average. The demand for production skill sets has reached or exceeded the supply of readily available workers. So our workforce, as we all know, is limited by population growth and a low unemployment rate. We heard from Chad from the city, we heard from Brian. <clears throat> um, we know that the chamber, we know that um, several other organizations, including Johnsonville, have prioritized attracting new workers to the area. So though the labor force partic participation rate and unemployment rate have been on the decline at the national level, level um, the monthly job openings, as you can see in manufacturing, have more than doubled. At the same time, the monthly voluntary separation rate has increased since the start of the, of the pandemic. So I decided to share these slides because I wanted to show you just how many open manufacturing positions we're seeing across the nation. And this is something that we're seeing locally as well, being the, the hub for manufacturing, Sheboygan County. All of these large companies are feeling it, feeling the pressure. Um, it's not just Johnsonville, it's Kohler, it's Sargento, it's Bemis, Rockline, um, master's gallery, you name it. We're all struggling to find workers, um, specifically in the manufacturing um, industry. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So we are really, <clears throat> we are really working um, to to bring in workers from outside of Sheboygan County to to um, to, to fill our lines. Um, because even though we're bringing in approximately 40 to 50 manufacturing members a month, that's not enough. Um, we have about 100 job openings locally at any given time. So we have plans in place to bring in folks. Um, <clears throat> one of our greatest challenges, and that's the reason why I'm here today, is the lack of affordable housing. So we are most impacted by housing shortages in the like 100, 170K to the 250K range. Um, also apartment shortages and shortage of contractors, which we've heard today. <clears throat> we are also looking for dorm style um, housing units for both temporary and permanent workers. And we know our options are very limited. Um, 
many of the major companies in this area are privately held and they, they aren't going anywhere, we aren't going anywhere. So we don't have the population to support our manufacturing growth. We have to bring people here. We have done, just like many other companies, quite a bit of work in the last couple of years to update our pay, to update our benefits, to have very attractive opportunities available. And we know that we have those available. We know that we can entice people to move to this area. We just need to have the infrastructure available um, to support those, those individuals. And we don't have that today. So a lack of affordable housing, it's our biggest barrier um, to meeting those labor needs and hitting our fill rate. Um, and that's, I mean, that's what I have today to share. I'd love to hear if you have any questions for Chad, Brian, or myself on this this subject. Thank you, Kristen. Anyone have any uh, questions for um, Kristen or for Brian? Chad had to step out, so. I have a question for Brian. <laughs> so um, I noticed on your slides there was notations about permanent supportive housing, um, and I'm wondering, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking that it's probably the same permanent supportive housing that I'm thinking of and that those some of the projects that Chad was actually talking about include some of those permanent supportive housing units. Um, but I just want to make sure I'm correct. And so I wanted to clarify it really quick. So permanent supportive housing is meant for individuals who are chronically homeless. So they, I think I talked about it in our last town hall. Um, so those are the individuals who have a disability and they've been homeless for 12 or more months in the last three years. So, and I want to make sure that I'm correct in assuming that. So I would just uh, phrase it this way. All populations and all projects on the funding recommendations, yeah. with anything that comes forward, we're trying to be as flexible with those dollars as possible. Okay. So that, are the eligible population? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are we guaranteeing that those, that population would be targeted specifically with that recommendation? No. But um, very definitely, we're not excluding them. And if there is an opportunity to partner to make something happen, then the answer would be absolutely, we'll try to work with that. Which brings up a good point about uh, workforce development and partnering and coming to solutions um, together. Um, I think that, that that's one way to step forward is to get some um, some coalitions going in relationship to the, the, the major employers in the area for helping um, with the workforce and affordability development. And, and I'll just say uh, uh, the SCDC has been working on those coalitions mm -hmm. since probably April of uh, 2021. Uh, and hopefully there will be uh, uh, some progress made and announced uh, over the next uh, three, four months, uh, so that uh, uh, very definitely um, it's a public-private partnership mm -hmm. to drive affordability in the housing market, um, because what you're seeing with just the private sector and the market conditions, we are getting homes at 300 and up, and that is not affordable for the workforce that we're trying to uh, recruit into the marketplace or for the majority of the families that live and work in Sheboygan today. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's where uh, we had to come up with some of the parameters on what's affordable, what's not, and what's the size of opportunities so that we truly can have a public-private partnership advancing strategies. And the city very definitely, with some of their activities, um, is taking a step forward as well. That, that wide spectrum that you were talking about, Kristen, came through in what you were talking about in relationship to your needs at Johnsonville and throughout the whole county, I'm sure. Anyone else have uh, any uh, questions that they would like for to be answered about the ARPA, ARPA recommendations or workforce? Um, Hey, Joe, this is Sue Kaiser. Hi, Sue. Hi. I do have a, a question for the uh, young lady that was talking just before when she, from Johnsonville, when she was commenting about 
bringing people in, you know, workers in, um, as to why, you know, is it, is it because like there are no people here in Sheboygan County, you know, like we, we've just outgrown Johnsonville and the other manufacturers with actual bodies or is it lack of training or, so I think there's quite a few factors involved. But, um, if you look at the, the graph that was shared, voluntary separations are up across all industries, but especially in the manufacturing industry um, through the pandemic. So we have quite a few people that um, have left the workforce and are jumping jobs uh, right now. We also have expanded Johnsonville. We, um, like I said, we're just hiring for a new facility in Sheboygan. Um, so we're increasing the number of people that are working. And we know that our uh, partners in the community have also expanded. So like I mentioned, several other manufacturing companies um, that are also going through expansions. So we just simply do not have the population available today to fill the open positions. Um, and so, yeah, we are all looking externally. We're all looking outside of Sheboygan County. Of course, we're going to continue the market within our county, um, but we know that in order to be successful, we have to bring other people into our area. And just to uh, add to that, um, sure. the mic, mic just to add to that, uh, probably two months ago, I believe it was, uh, I was talking to the Job Center um, market analyst. And I think there was uh, less than 800 people on unemployment in the county. Mm -hmm. So when you look at total employment uh, and our unemployment rate, uh, we are um, what would be traditionally considered full employment. And so uh, it's, um, there's people, but we are, there's a natural churn. Uh, and so uh, very definitely it's needing to recruit in uh, to really help fill the need. And I'll just say, I know of um, companies that have uh, over 200 positions available. Uh, and so just with some of the uh, larger corporations, it's, uh, there is a desperate need for talent. Mm -hmm. So Brian, we have this one question here and uh, um, I, I guess I just throw it out there and see how you might answer that question is, how will the ARPA dollars impact the wide spectrum of housing needs, like homeless to the un, unable to find housing, both renting and buying homes? So the whole wide spectrum, the ARPA dollars, how do you see that as, as impacting them for affordability and workforce, just off the cuff? <laughs> I'm not an elected official, and uh -huh. I would say that is really up to the governing bodies of the city of Sheboygan as well as Sheboygan County. Um, I think uh, we have uh, very informed local elected officials uh, that um, uh, have the best interests of all the residents uh, in mind. Um, so I think um, countywide, you're going to probably look at things a little bit differently than maybe the city of Sheboygan, um, just because of the uh, different needs or the perceived uh, uh, needs in the marketplace. Uh, I think the city of Sheboygan has a lot more data um, that they can make decisions on, where the county might be more general uh, and less targeted. Uh, that would just be my initial reaction, just because the county is going to be covering all the municipalities, uh, where the city very definitely uh, with their dollars, uh, I know they're allocating to some of the projects already, um, but uh, depending on if the grants come in that they've, I know that they've applied for additional grants. Uh, so the question will be is, will they have dollars to target um, Everybody. across the board? Yeah. So Good, thank you. Thank yep. you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Otherwise we will be once again, coming together, there will be a panel of, and we're trying to get uh, some faces that you maybe have seen here and then some that may be new for uh, next time around. We will um, try to find the full spectrum uh, that we've had in the last three um, town halls. And 
as you register, you may have specific questions, and please put your questions in the registration form, and we'll tackle those, and we'll also tackle them in the real time that we are through technology. Oh, I love it. So, so any other final thoughts? No, I just thank you for the presenters, and again, to the city of Sheboygan and everybody who came, and um, I think the first-time home buyer stuff is phenomenal. It'll move some people out of rentals and open up those rentals for other people. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate it. Thank you.